Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth East. I'm a director here at LA Louvre Gallery, and I'd like to welcome you all this evening um, to the gallery, to Fanny Sanin's exhibition, and to our guest lecturer, Patrick Frank. Um, before I introduce him, I'd like to say a few thank yous to my colleagues here in the gallery, and in particular, Christina Carlos, um, Stephen Kugerberg, who's behind here, on sound, um, Jacob, Susan, and Michelle Trisosto, who helped organize this event. Um, I'd also like, of course, to thank Fanny Sanin, um, who is not here tonight. Uh, she's back in New York for giving us this beautiful exhibition of paintings and works on paper from 1967 to this year. Um, introducing Patrick Frank, who, by the way, also wrote the text for our announcement and for the online catalog. Um, Patrick received his PhD from George Washington University. In the 1990s and early 2000s, he taught art history at the University of Colorado and the University of Kansas. In 2005, he left academia and devoted um, most of his time to writing. Um, and since that time has published six books on Latin American art. In addition to that, he has published and is now entering its 12th edition, uh, one of the most widely used textbooks in colleges throughout the United States called Art Forms. In 2015, um, together with Jacqueline Barnett's, he authored 20th Century Art of Latin America, and his most recent book is this one, which is Manifestos and Polemics in Latin American Modern Art. By the way, we have these reference books for anyone who's interested at the, the front desk. Um, so, without further ado and belaboring the point, I'd like you all to join me to give Patrick a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do here is basically the opposite of what I did in the essay that I wrote for the catalog. The essay that I wrote for the catalog is focused on one theme in Fanny's mature work. This, this lecture is going to do just about the opposite. Instead of focusing on one aspect of her mature work, it's going to focus on her early work quite a bit. And instead of focusing on one thing, I'm going to loop around an awful lot. So this, this, this lecture consists of a series of loops. It will be a loopy lecture. <laughs> Can we have the lights down, please? That's great. Loop number one. The Colombian environment during Fanny's formative years. The earliest painting I could find by her that's at all interesting from an art historical point of view is this one. 1962. Looking at this work, you can see that it's an abstract work. It's fairly painterly. It's um, it looks spontaneous. It's also um, somewhat considered in its execution, I would say. It's poetic, that kind of thing. And then, see, I'm an art historian. And, and art historians always want to explain how things got the way they are. How did this happen? Where, where did this come from? And if you look around in the Colombian environment at that time that she was painting, and she was in school at the University of the Andes, which was one of the top art schools in Colombia at that time, you can see various similarities between her work and that of others. For example, one of the leading abstract painters in Colombia at that time was a German emigre named Guillermo Wiedemann. He was from Berlin, and he was living in Berlin in 1938 and 9, and he left Nazi Germany when it got too uncomfortable for modern artists. And so he took up residence in Colombia. Here's a work of his from 1963, Forms Over Yellow. And it's an abstract work. It's painterly. It's spontaneous, yet considered somewhat poetic, right? 
Um, Fanny had never studied with, with Wiedemann, but he was very well known and she knew about his work. Who did she study with? Well, Juan Antonio Rota was one of her teachers in Colombia in the early 1960s. And Rota was going through a stage of abstraction at the time that Fanny studied with him. And so this work called Tomb, and there's a fly crawling across the <laughs> screen there. Oh, he left, okay. <laughs> this work called Tomb is pretty brushy, pretty um, improvisational, pretty um, spontaneous looking, right? It's, it's for Latin America, it's pretty spontaneous and expressionistic. Um, here's, a, here's a piece by Fanny from a few years later, 1965. And we see, you know, she's rationalizing things a little more. There are fewer masses in this work. There's a suggestion of a horizon line there, maybe, you know? Um, Fanny's influences were not only from Colombia, but also from Europe. She was very interested, for example, she told me, in Antony Tapies, the Spanish abstract artist. And Tapies made these poetic, textured, evocative, abstract things that were profoundly influential on her and a lot of other artists. <clears throat> not only that, European abstraction is really the primary influence on all of these artists, on Guillermo Wiedemann, on Juan Antonio Roda, and on Fanny Sanin. European abstraction like Pierre Soulage here from 1952. This work too is painterly, abstract, spontaneous yet considered, poetic perhaps, and the title gives you no sense of any storyline, right? Painting October 10th, 1952. That's a habit that Fanny also picked up. If you notice the titles of her works, often the year of the painting is part of the title, acrylic number four, 1972, that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, to call this style abstract expressionism is not quite accurate because it wasn't primarily influenced by people like Jackson Pollock, de Kooning, Franz Klein. The Americans were more spontaneous, more explosive, more urgent, as opposed to this sort of thing. This is by Clorindo Testa. This is an Argentine artist from 1961. Si nombre means without a title or without a name. Um, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here in loop number one is that this considered European style of abstraction was international at that time when Fanny was coming up. And so here's an example from Argentina by Clorindo Testa. And, and trivia fanatics might know that Clorindo Testa later went on to become to some renown as an architect. He designed the National Library, for example, in Buenos Aires. This was an international movement, and, and the, in Latin America, they don't call it abstract expressionism, they call it informalism, informalismo. That's the most common name by which this style goes, and we just saw an example from Argentina. Here's one from Cuba, Guido Guinas, painting, 1958. There was a movement of informalist artists in Cuba in the late 50s and early 60s as well, and, you know, this is so, Fanny is well within that informalist way of working. <clears throat> the earliest work in our present exhibition, the one that's in the next room, is this work from 1967 by Fanny. I put FS because, you know, Fanny Sanin, you got that, right? Oil number four. And what, what you can't see in a picture like this is the surface texture of this work, which Fanny achieved through the highly technical method of cigarette ashes, <laughs> sprinkling them on the canvas. I said, did you smoke back then, Fanny? And she said, yeah, I smoked a couple packs a day. She doesn't smoke anymore. She gave it up at a certain point, I'm happy to say. 
So, but like Antony Tapies, she applies a certain amount of texture to the work. It's abstract, it's painterly, it's, it's, it's somewhat spontaneous, but also considered. And if, when I looked at this, when I first saw this work, and I think it was probably in Fanny's studio a few years ago, when I first saw this work, I said to myself, self, this looks like it wants to resolve itself into geometry. If these forms are evolving, where are they going to go next? In my opinion, they're going to go towards, they're going to go towards, they're, they're, they're going to go towards, not that, a slide I have coming up in a few minutes. This all, already it wants to be vertical. Already it wants to organize itself, I think. The direction this would evolve, if we're going to take a few more steps, would be toward a greater sense of organization. And um, that's, 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 that's the direction of Fanny's art in the late 60s, early 70s, and ever since. Well, not ever since. I'm going to complicate that statement in a minute. But at this stage, she's, there, I already sense a tendency toward more organization. <clears throat> now, in Colombia, there are already informalist painters. We've established that, I hope. Already in Colombia, there was a very strong movement of figural art. This movement was stronger and more highly regarded at the time than the informalist tendency was. So a number of artists did figural art, such as Alvaro Obregón. And when I mention these names, by the way, like Juan Antonio Rota and Alvaro Obregón and the rest, I'm mentioning people that are very well known in Colombia, OK? They're nationally known in that country. This work is called Violencia 1962, and you can see that there is a woman, a pregnant woman, lying on horizontal. This work takes up the theme of violence directly. There has been a lot of political violence in Colombia for many decades, which has just recently come to a close with the peace treaty that the government signed with the FARC rebels oh, a year or two ago. <clears throat> But political violence has been endemic in Colombia for decades. And so Alvaro Obregón took up that theme in this work. And it uses some of the techniques of informalism, a textured, brushy, painterly surface and a considered sense of execution. But the inclusion of the human form and the title instantly locates it. This is Colombia. This is violence. This is a tragedy. This is a national issue. And figural artists dominated the news back then when Fanny was working. Here's a work by Pedro Alcantara called These Are Your Heroes. <clears throat> it is a print, as you can see. A lot of artists were printmakers in Colombia because the art market was not that well developed. And by making prints, an artist reaches a wider audience. So a lot of, our, a lot of these figural artists were also devoted to printmaking. Alcantara is one of them. And just look at this. These are your heroes. Hmm. Boy, he doesn't look too heroic. To me, he looks like he's coming apart. He looks like his intestines are wrapped around him. Monsters have attacked him or, or somehow messed with him. Doesn't look very heroic to me. And in fact, I mean, the political violence, insofar as I have studied it, it seems to me that the political violence was bad on all sides, generally speaking. There, weren't, there were very few people who wore white hats in the, tra in the traditional sense. So these artists, the figural artists, are talking about a reality that was present and that they are thoughtfully weighing in their paintings. Luis Caballero was a, was a classmate of Fanny's at the University of the Andes in the early 1960s, and he painted figural paintings like this, mostly throughout his entire career, he painted dead people, cadavers, bodies, <clears throat> very mournful, drawn, I expect, from, if you can call to mind that painting by Eugene Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People with the Dead Bodies Along the Front, or Goya's Disasters of War, perhaps, something like that. 
Um, Luis Caballero, again, he's one of the leading people, and Fanny knew him in, in school and that kind of thing. There was even a school of Marxist, Leninist, leftist, socialist realism in Colombia at that time. Artists who wanted their art to directly reflect the political struggle in an ov absolutely overt way. Clemencia Lucena, long live the marching workers, and then they're carrying a sign that says, the land is for those who work it. Clemencia Lucena founded a workshop called the Red Four Workshop, and they specialized in lithographs that, had, that made explicit political comments about political violence in Colombia, in this case from a very tendentious leftist point of view. <clears throat> Colombian political violence began pretty early. The political violence in Colombia really began in 1948. This is a newspaper from Bogota, the front cover. Bogota is almost destroyed. Cord cowardly assassination of Dr. Gaitan. The political violence in Colombia began in April of 1948 when Jorge Eliezer Gaitan was murdered on the street. Gaitan was a politician who cut through the dualities of Colombian political life at the time. He, the, the political parties were both of the elites and they kind of traded in power, ignoring most of the people. And Gaitan came out of the people and said things that kind of galvanized opposition. He said, Hunger has no political party. Poverty is not conservative or liberal. Let's work on it. And well, and guess what? In 1948, he was assassinated. <clears throat> that set off a wave of violence that continued on and off until they just recently signed the political agreement with the FARC rebels a year and a half ago. Um, <clears throat> The political violence took different forms in different periods. In the 50s, it was mostly about land reform and workers' rights. Then in the 60s, with the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, a lot of it became a leftist sort of a thing, and that's where the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia were, came out because they patterned themselves after leftist revolutionary movements. Then in the 80s and 90s, the drug trade brought vast amounts of wealth to Colombia, which had fueled both right and leftist people carrying out political violence from both the right and the left. So it's, a, it's an awful, awful story. Not all the figural art in Colombia is explicitly political. <clears throat> Some of it's rather clever. Here's a piece by Beatriz Gonzalez. She painted it on a bedstead. She would buy furniture and create paintings on it. This is called Exit Stage Rear, and I'm translating the title. The title, it's a, she didn't title it Exit Stage Rear, she titled it in Spanish, but you get the point. <clears throat> this is based on uh, a historical painting of the death of, of one of Colombia's independence leaders. You can, you can sense the academic reality behind this. <clears throat> Beatriz Gonzalez also went to the University of the Andes where Fanny studied. If you have been to the Hammer Museum, you might have seen this work by Beatriz Gonzalez, which is in that show at the Hammer Museum. As you can see, it's a painting on a piece of furniture. This one's just called Lullaby. And, and Beatriz Gonzalez, like, like the United States pop artists, was very influenced by, by magazine illustrations and, um, and cheap popular prints and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Not explicitly political, but figural, okay? And of course, Colombia's most famous artist, Fernando Botero, came out of this Colombian figural tradition. Fernando Botero is a figural artist, isn't he? He is not often explicitly political. This is called The President's Family, and it has the same date, by the way, as the painting by Fanny Sanin that's in the other room, just to contextualize people here. He, he thought up this kind of blown up like a balloon look. That's his kind of trademark, right? <clears throat> and he's mostly non-political except 
um, in, in, in around the turn of the millennium, he did a series of paintings on the theme of Colombian political violence. I just grabbed a bunch of these from my personal slide collection, selected works on the theme of Colombian violence that he did in a couple of year period around the turn of the millennium. <clears throat> and of course, they have that same blown up like a balloon style, but it reflects political violence in that reality. And then more recently, he also did a series on the, if you remember the Iraq war, the Abu Ghraib scandal where they abused all those prisoners, he also did a series on that too, which is now at the Berkeley Art Museum. So in that context, let's look again. What's Fanny doing? What choices has she made here? What position is she taking in that spectrum of possibilities that's before a person? Every artist, when they're starting out, has a spectrum of possibilities to choose from, right? They can, they, they sort of, they, they navigate by the compass points that they see around them, see? So what's she chosen to do? She has chosen to do something that is not overtly political, that is not even nationalistic, right? This is cosmopolitan art. Informalism was a cosmopolitan style. It, it, it looks beyond Columbia's borders. And it doesn't look at political reality, rather it's kind of introspective. Informalism is a fairly introspective style. That's what she, that's what she went with. Um, was she ever connected to Colombian political violence? Well, yes. The, uh, the politician, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, who was assassinated in 1948, was a friend of her mother's. So she knew she was not immune or aloof, physically present in Colombia during the time when these things were happening. But she chose this cosmopolitan, international, more avant-garde too, I might point out, style of painting. <clears throat> A nice sound effect, but I didn't, I, I didn't plan it. <laughs> Between 1967 and 1970, her style evolved quite a bit. And I'm going to claim a certain amount of vindication, okay? Because what I saw happening here was this resolving into verticals. <laughs> I'm going to say, ha, <laughs> right? <laughs> Art historians aren't supposed to predict the future, and it's notoriously terrible. Not a good idea to try to do that, but I think it worked in this case. Acrylic number 13, 1970. By this time, she has left Columbia. She left Columbia in 62 or 3. She lived in Monterey, Mexico. At the time she painted this, she was living in London. She came back to Monterey, Mexico. She lived in Illinois for a while where she did some graduate study. She was somewhat peripatetic between 1967 and 1971 or so, living in London, Monterey, Mexico, Illinois. <clears throat> and then, you know, that's, that's what, it's in that environment that her style evolves in this direction toward this more geometric, measured style. <clears throat> Loop number two. Okay, that was loop number one, okay? There's gonna be three of these, okay? So that gives you a sense of where we are in the, you know? Because <clears throat> my, my eighth grade speaking teacher said, it's best to have an outline and let this audience know where you are on the outline. And so, you know, three's good, so that's great. I hope I'm doing all right so far. <clears throat> so, once you decide to become an abstract painter, geometric abstract painter, boy oh boy, are you in trouble in Latin America? There are so many options available to you for geometric abstract painting in Latin America. Oh my gosh. A lot of people aren't really aware of this aspect of Latin American art. If you are, that's great. If not, I'm here to help you. <clears throat> if you've been up to the Getty, to the exhibition of Argentine art at the Getty, you might have seen this work by Juan Melee called Cut Out Frame. The date is 1946. It's a piece of geometric abstraction 
But it's also, and this is crucial, shaped. That's the work against the white background. It is a shaped canvas. And then, you know, when I was in graduate school, clear up to the time when I was in graduate school, my teachers tried to tell me that Frank Stella invented the shaped canvas. Guess what? They were lying. <laughs> they didn't know it, but they were lying. The shaped canvas was invented in Argentina in the years immediately after World War II. There were two movements of abstract painting in Argentina and centered in Buenos Aires. One was called Concrete Invention, and the other was called Madi. Concrete invention, they, they called it that because, because well, this is not abstract art. This is concrete art, they said. Because to abstract means to take from. This art is not taken from anything. Rather, it's invented. It's a concretion. So, cut out frame describes it. <clears throat> Madi and concrete invention were amazing things. Oh boy, I mean, gee whiz, these are so creative. Raul Lotza, this is very similar to a work that's also with the Getty. I don't know if it's the exact same one, but Lotza did this kind of thing. Geometric abstraction, panels over a colored background. That's the frame surrounding it there. So he, he thought of the framing, the, he thought of the surrounding colors to surround the geometric things that he deployed. <clears throat> and again, this is novel. This is, this is contemporary, you know, with Jackson Pollock, you know. Jackson Pollock is... Everybody says, you know, I'm getting on my favorite hobby horse here. I'm sorry to say I apologize for this. But everybody says New York was the center of the art world. Well, I'm saying that's just not true. Buenos Aires was also a center of the art world. This is very creative. Nobody was doing this kind of thing. Okay? Nobody. Alfredo Lito. I'm kind of on a roll here with that Getty show. This work, this work is actually in the Getty show. Chromatic Rhythms, 1947. Lito was a, was a member of the Madi movement, and the Madi movement included poets and composers, dancers, that kind of thing. It was multidisciplinary. And this piece is named after what music will do, chromatic rhythms. He was a big fan of 12-tone music, but that's, that would be getting us too far afield. <clears throat> so when Fanny's coming up, these are the options she's thinking of. The, she knew about this stuff. Geometric abstract art really started in Buenos Aires and then it radiated outward like to Brazil. Ligia Clark, composition, 1953. This is a very early work by Ligia Clark. <clears throat> if you know Ligia Clark's work, you know that later she created flexible objects that the viewer could manipulate. She called them bichos, which means like critters. But that's a tendency that's common to Latin American abstract art is that it jumps off of the canvas and into three dimensions. Leisure Clark jumped definitely into three dimensions. And then she also, oh boy, she, um, she created body suits that viewers were supposed to put on and reach out to each other with different kinds of shades over their eyes. Art as a bodily experience. So she, she got her start, as you can see, looking at the Madi and Concrete Invention people, but then she took it beyond the picture plane. Helio Oitasica was also active in the later 50s doing abstract paintings. This is called Meta Scheme, and that's a painting. The, the whole white part, that, that's a painting. He painted the white background as well. This is not an installation shot. <clears throat> Oitasica, of course, oh boy, you know. Likewise, he didn't keep it he didn't keep it within the confines of the canvas. He later evolved into events, dances, capes you could put on, that kind of thing. Venezuela had also had its share and still has its share of geometric abstract art. Alejandro Otero did a whole series called Color Rhythms in which he painted a series of black vertical bars with all kinds of geometric shapes in different colors with the vertical bars providing a certain sense of rhythm. Alejandro Otero made, oh God, a couple hundred of these things, color rhythm studies. <clears throat> and then he later broke out into the third dimension. Um, 
If you can call, t if you've been to the National Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C., right outside that museum is a giant stainless steel thing with whirling uh, um, trapezoids that are moved by the wind over a reflecting pool. It's a work by Alejandro Otero next to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. So he too jumped off the picture plane and into the third dimension. Jesus Rafael Soto, these are names people know, I imagine. I mean, this is a work that consists of two planes, one, one a few inches in front of the other. You can see the bolts holding it together there so that when the viewer walks by, when the viewer walks by, you see the interaction of the two layers of the, of the work. And then finally, Carlos Cruz Diez, he did this installation in the International Airport in Caracas. Uh, this is called Color Interpenetrations or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but you see what it is. It's a mosaic tile floor with thousands of tiny squares with uh, stripes and, 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 and diagonals on the floor of the, um, of the, airport, of the airport lobby. And right now, um, outside the Broad Museum downtown, they're going to paint a similar one on the intersection of Grand Avenue, part of the PST LALA. Cruz Diaz's workshop, he's still alive by the way, his workshop is coming to execute this thing. I'm not sure if it's there yet or not. It's there. I need to get down there and see it. So once again, we loop back. You look at the options available. And in Latin American abstract art, there are so many options available. What does Fanny do? She chooses an audaciously simple tack. She chooses the most restrained, the most introspective, the, the, the least flamboyant mo mode, version of geometric abstraction. Acrylic number 13, 1970. And then of course, <clears throat> I ask myself, how did she get here? In the other room, you can see a series of small studies that she did Little works, just a few inches across. There, 1968 to 69. This is on the pathway to those vertical stripes. <clears throat> Where'd she get the idea to do this? Well, she had seen work by Ellsworth Kelly. Ellsworth Kelly was a prime influence when she was living in London. She saw an exhibition called The Art of the Real which included work by Kelly, including some of this curvy, brightly colored, simple composition sort of thing, and you can see that she's inspired by that. Ellsworth Kelly also went through a phase where he was doing vertical stripes as well. Spectrum, 1967. Kelly's very methodical, isn't he? Because, you know, that's the, that's the spectrum right there. You know, the usual colors that you maybe learned when you were in junior high school. <clears throat> Another principal influence on her was Kenneth Noland. Noland was doing striped paintings too for a while. <clears throat> she was very stimulated by this. There's the work that's right behind us, now in the show. Acrylic number 9, 1970. She was living in London at this time, okay? So what's the pathway? Her models are not exactly in Latin America, are they? She's a Latin American artist, yes. She's still sending works back to Colombia every year, yes. They're still giving her exhibitions in Bogota nearly every year, yes. But she's looking outside the boundaries of Latin America itself. There's a certain paradox there. The Latin American artist who doesn't look much at the art from her own region, but that's all right. I, 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 I forgive her for that. Loop three. The course she chose after 1974. 
An interesting thing happened in 1974. Well, yeah, yeah. And then you can see, <laughs> this is, I love this effect here. It's like, it's not very often when I give a lecture that this happens, right? <laughs> we can really do the color check on our equipment here, can't we? <laughs> this, looks way, this looks brighter and more snazzy, doesn't it? This looks way more, you know. But if this were illuminated, it would look pretty bright and snazzy, too. <clears throat> she latched on to the concept of symmetry. Symmetry in 1974 became a calling card for her, for her work. Um, I asked her about this. That's what sort of person I am. I said, What's, what, what in the devil is so exciting about symmetry? And she answered me in a way that a lot of artists tend to do when I probe too much. They, she said, I don't know, I just wanted to. All right, no problem. That's not sufficient for me, though, because I'm an art historian. I want to know how it happened. Well, I have a guess. This is my theory, okay? And it's not a radical theory, but it's a theory. She was looking at Joseph Albert's. Albers in the late 40s did some paintings like this, geometric, abstract, symmetrical, oh, rectangular even, right? <clears throat> she admires Joseph Albers an awful lot. Joseph Albers made a lot of symmetrical paintings, but you, maybe you know what Joseph Albers did. He resolved it down to a bunch of concentric squares. He did a whole a couple hundred paintings, homage to the square in which squares overlay each other and each square is a different color so that you, you forget the symmetry and you just sort of work with the colors in your mind, seeing dissonances and, and harmonies and rhythms and depth and space in a simple composition like that. So Fanny <clears throat> took up the concept of symmetry. This work is over there, 1977. And then, so beginning in 1974 and continuing until today, okay, until 2017, every work she has painted has been symmetrical. Now, in the essay, I, I presented some theories about how that sort of thing functions. I'm not going to go over that here today. But what I want to do is talk about a couple of things that are here in the hall, like, for example, this work over here. When she gets involved with symmetry, she experiments with simplicity and complexity. How simple do I make the, comp the composition? How complex? And unity and variety. This is fairly unified in the number, of the, there's, there's a certain rhythm of squares in this work that doesn't exist in the previous one that we just saw. Over here, there's more variety. Some of them are long and thin, narrow, wide, this kind of thing. This has a more obvious rhythm to it. And then another thing that always preoccupies her is what to do with verticals. Often there's, often there's a pair of verticals that goes from, one, from the top to the bottom just bisecting the whole thing, which is pretty normal, I guess, if you're a symmetrical artist like she is. She likes to do that. Nineteen seventy-eight. Each of these paintings is arrived at after five to eight, maybe ten studies. Several of the studies are on view in the gallery here too, for you to look at, and you know you can see how she. I've actually done this. I've I've looked at them and talked about them with her. What were you doing here? I think you took that out because of this. Was that true? Well, yes or no. And then how, how did you arrive at this? And so if I were to compare this to music, which, which Fanny is okay with me doing because I asked her about that. I said, are you influenced by music? I said, what do you like to listen to? She said, Bela Bartok. Bela Bartok's work is very dissonant. It verges on atonality, but guess what? Bela Bartok's work is often symmetrical in its composition. I didn't say this in the essay, but I'm saying it now. 
This is a parallel. This is my little gray cells telling me this, that Bela Bartok composed works in what he called the arch format, where you start out with one theme, and then you go to another theme and another theme, it reaches a climax kind of in the middle of the movement, then it trails off with the same themes repeating each way, and it ends like just as it began. There are symmetrical compositions, and I'm thinking specifically, for those of you music geeks, of the first movement of the music for strings, percussion, and celeste, okay? and some of the string quartet movements. They're symmetrical. They're arched format. And then, you know, music is an abstract art too, right? Music need not depict anything or be about anything to be interesting, right? I mean, you know, this guy who just passed away, Tom Petty, good songwriter, wrote songs. But music doesn't have to speak that way. It can speak through purely abstract means. Sound, duration, scale, pitch, etc. So there's a... She's, she's a partisan of, of painters who think of music as an allied art form. <clears throat> and then here's another work that's also on display. This is over Elizabeth's desk in the other room. <clears throat> Sometimes Fanny's symmetries veer toward the emblematic. They begin to veer toward looking like emblems of something to me. That's just, you know what I see in this sometimes. Emblems are usually symmetrical. They can be representational or not. They usually use bright contrasting colors. <clears throat> I think the 80s was a very good decade for Fanny. <clears throat> the 80s was a very good decade. This is a work that I wrote about in the announcement to this show. <clears throat> That was when she, um, she moved to New York in 1971 or two, I think it was. And um, in, in the 80s, she had a numerous exhibitions in New York. She was reviewed in the New York Times by John Russell, who gave her a very favorable review. He described her color palette as hooded, which I think is a very good word to describe her color palette in the 80s. Generally, it's a hushed color palette, not primary, earthy in quality that kind of thing. And in all cases, that work, that work, oh, well, hey, look at that. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> in all cases, the works function like chamber music does, OK? Chamber music is not bombastic. Chamber music is subtle. Chamber music works within a narrow range. Chamber music is contrapuntal. Chamber music can be introspective thinking not only of Bartok's string quartets, but of Beethoven's string quartets and Mozart's string quartets. Chamber music is cool. I, I really like chamber music. And maybe that explains why I like, I have to say, I, this art, absolutely. <clears throat> um, an interesting thing happened in 1988. And the 80s were a very good decade. She got a lot of reviews, very favorable, you know, doing very well. And in 1988, she had a retrospective exhibition at the National Museum in Bogota, Colombia. The National Museum in her home country staged a full course retrospective. This is the first time this had ever really happened, from the early works to, to up to the present moment in 1988. <clears throat> and um, um, so I asked her, what, did the, what was that like? What was that like seeing all your works at the same time? And she said, I couldn't paint for about a year afterwards. What to do next? Well, what to do next was interesting. After that retrospective, she began to introduce diagonals into her paintings. Now, normally you might think, oh, great, diagonals, right? But no, diagonals are important. They had fistfights about diagonals. In, in Holland in the 1920s, when Piet Mondrian was around, they were like arguing over this. And there she did it. You can see over there, in that work from the 90s, diagonals. The works that introduced diagonals, if, if, if these works can be emblematic, the works from the 90s that introduced diagonals become more organic. They can suggest growth 
upward movement. I, I told her this. I said, Fanny, your works often suggest to me upward movement. She said, oh, really? <laughs> so that, uh, that's just, you know, me talking. And then I, sometimes they suggest, and this is probably, she won't like it that I said this, they sometimes suggest the human form, you know? Because we are symmetrical and we tend to be diagonal, you know, in various ways, various times. Yeah, I can see that in there. <clears throat> the other thing I notice about her art is, and I, and I confronted her about this too. <laughs> I don't know why I do this. I probably should learn not to. You know, you tend to put the brightest colors near the center. Ever notice that? No, I haven't. Oh, well, okay, thank you. You know, art historians come up with useless observations like that all the time. Then the things that art historians say are rarely of interest to artists. I have learned to live with that fact. <laughs> and then, in the 2000s, something else happens. Look at this work. This is absolutely rebellious. This is com a complete overturning of the chessboard, okay? Because look, that line is not straight. It has a slight bulge to it. <laughs> and this black form is not exactly symmetrical. It's, it's, it's bulged out some, okay? It's, it's an innovation. Fanny is restless like that. She, with, within the confines of her chosen medium and style, which is a walled garden, okay? It's a walled garden. If you decide to paint symmetrically and geometrically, there's nobody else on planet Earth who's done it the way she has. Nobody. Within that walled garden, she's full of surprises. Once you get your mind into the mental space of these paintings, a friend of mine who lives in Canada is the chair of an art department up there, an art historian, you know, and I sent her an inf information about this show and with the catalog, the online catalog, and she said, Fanny's paintings are spellbinding. That sounds pretty good. I'll take that. I'll believe that. So, not, so you know, we get various things. There's, a, there's something new built, brewing up all the time. And then you get the, this greater intricacy of detail in the 2000s with with different sizes of, of elements. <clears throat> so I think if I've said all I was planning on saying in loop three. <clears throat> yeah, I think pretty much I have. Here's a photo of Fanny in her studio taken a couple of years ago. There she is. You can see on the right wall one of her early paintings in that transition period between 1967 and 1970. You can see on that, up, on that sloping desk some drawings, and then there's a flat painting there next to her. Guess what? It's this painting right here. She's working on this painting in her studio, which is a um, rather capacious apartment on the Upper East Side with north-facing windows. There's a bank of north-facing windows on the left edge of this, just out of the frame. And her studio is lit by natural light. So she only paints when the natural light is good enough. <clears throat> which kind of limits your working day in the wintertime, naturally, which means you get to have your glass of wine sooner. So there she is. And I'm, now I remember how I was going to conclude loop number three, which is the final loop of this loopy lecture. The story with Fanny is still continuing. She may still think of something else within the walled garden that she has staked out for herself. She will probably think of something else, just about equally interesting, riveting, spellbinding, as I heard it put once. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Would anyone like to ask me anything, throw anything?
Yes, Lisa. So, uh, would you care to comment on... Oh, yeah, we're, we're recording this. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm curious uh, for you to just talk about the uh, people who do abstract work who write about it and for whom um, there's kind of a stated program and artists and it seems to me that Fanny is one of them who are more experiential in their approach to evolving their work. Who are you thinking of when you think of artists who write and have a program, a stated program, like, uh, like Kandinsky maybe, or Mondrian, or somebody like that? Yeah, or, yeah. What are you asking me about that? Well, I'm curious because in one way the work seems so rigorous, Yes. and yet you said you had to ask her these questions yeah. and press for the direction. She's very introspective. She's a quiet person who's very content to stay in the studio like Einstein, you know? Doing it all in her mind all day long and, and every few months she comes out with a new one and we're all waiting to see what it's gonna be. She's not a grandstander. Some artists who write manifestos do so for, for political reasons. They wanna, I want the whole world to know what I'm trying to do here. You know, that kind of thing. There's a certain tendency that certain painters have got, not only abstract artists, but she's not of that. How am I doing at answering your question? Well. Kind of clear as mud, I guess, but I hope it, co <laughs> hope it covers the ground. <clears throat> what else would you like to, yes? I did go to the exhibit um, with a piece you were talking about that had the outline. Oh yeah, the cutout yeah. frame by Juan yeah, Millet, the, yeah, right. And, and what they were explaining was so um, original about that, or interesting, was that the straight line was a new, was something that was new, where they were using a ruler to cut out and create these abstract images that were so precise. And I, is that, is that you think what some of the f um, intrigue is about these very geometric, symmetric shapes? Well, in, in that time, it's not innovative to use a ruler to make an abstract painting in the That's 1940s. That's what the Getty was emphasizing. It's, I disagree with that. I <laughs> okay. need, to know, need to know more about where they're coming from when they said that. Okay. Um, Fanny uses rulers and tapes, yes. And she also plans out the compositions really rigorously before she sets to work painting it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's the way I disagree sometimes with what museums do. It's just the way it is. And they disagree with what I do sometimes. Yeah. So that's fine. Do you think some of the fascination then is, is in the color choice and in the rhythm? Um, are you asking me about what? What do you think her driving force is? Is it, you think it's the color and the rhythm? Of the well, you know, I'd love to say it was the color, but her color varies so much, mm -hmm. you know? From that to that is quite a distance. But a relationship of colors. Her, her colors, the colors she chooses are distinctive. Yeah. Um, and they're not primary for the most part. No. Um, she experiments within a certain range. I mean, that's gonna be a big surprise, isn't it? So her color choices are a distinctive thing, and to me, they contribute to the interest. Some people make a big deal out of that. Some critics who've written about her work make a lot of hay about that. Peter Frank did, for example, who, Peter Frank, by the way, of LA, was one of the first people to curate a show of Fanny's work in New York back in the early 70s. Trivia item. Peter Frank is not related to me. Wish I, I wish I could say he was, but he's not. My own family's far less interesting than that. Sorry, I got distracted. Where were we? <laughs> yeah, her color choices are a crucial part. To me, they suggest that something important is happening. Because you can sense how well chosen the colors are. Yeah, that's what tells me something important and sort of worth thinking about is happening on the canvas. Yes. Um, several of these works have a really monumental feel to them. Do you know if she had in, any engagement with architecture? You know, you're raising an excellent point. Other people have noticed that. There's a certain architectonic quality. Yeah. She achieves this through balancing pictorial energies, suggesting large masses moving slowly or not moving at all large masses that, that are placed there with effort. And, and, and those things remind you of architecture. I can see why you would say that. Um, did she ever study architecture? No. Is she interested in architecture? Yes. 
Does she know Colombian architects? Yes, she knows who they are. We discussed a few of them when she was here. She cares about architecture. And whether there's any direct influence, I don't know. Can't say. There need not be, though, really. There need not be. Um, yes, Lauren. So, um, so she's Latin American, she's an abstract, um, geometric leader who loves symmetry, and there are no crucibles. Yeah, so? It almost seems like she's spending all the time making sure one doesn't. Come well, out. part of the goal of her work is to create something that doesn't resemble anything. Because once, once a painting starts to resemble something, then there's a problem. You have to, you have to, because these works are about pictorial energies moving and interacting and colliding and, and, and moving forward and backward. And if something resembles things too much, it distracts the viewer. So yeah. And that's part of the goal of all those drawings, is to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of distance from normal visual reality. People, when they look at abstract paintings, they'll, they'll flip through a mental Rolodex. You know, it took me years to get out of this habit, decades maybe even, to look at this and not see an airplane or something. You know, a grapevine on a trellis. You know, that's a, it's a very difficult skill to, to divorce yourself from that. And Fanny wants to help us to see abstractly. That's why she does all those drawings to take the work away from, you can't remove it completely because somebody's gonna look at that and see their mother or their math teacher, to take the work away from something easily identifiable. Because once you take it away from what's easily identifiable, that's when the game begins. That's when the pictorial energies start to take on a life of their own. That's when it gets interesting. Yes. When we say that she's um, a Latin American artist, it seems to me that many artists who move to other places, who've lived the majority of their lives in other places, whose influences have come from other places, it's hard for me to think of people like that as um, grounded in the place that they're from. I get that. I get that. It's a good point. Um, yeah. You could say that I've just made the case that she's not very well grounded in her place, haven't I? Because I pointed out Joseph Albers and Ellsworth Kelly and Kenneth Noland, all wonderful Latin American artists, all of them, right? Yeah. 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 But here's the question I would ask you in return. To what extent does art need to be rooted in that way? Well, she's in this show, that's why, and part of the Getty LALA. Yeah. -L -A. <laughs> okay. She was born and raised in Colombia, had her art training in Colombia. She still keeps up with Colombia, regularly sends work to Colombia. So in that sense, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, there's, I read a quote by a Cuban artist who said, Latin American artists today are sick of showing their passports. <laughs> Why does it have to have a passport? Now, I grant you that a lot of art that's rooted is compelling. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. I can think of half a dozen people at any given moment whose art is very rooted in their context. Thomas Hart Benton. I don't know. There's a lot of people you could think of. But it doesn't need to be so. And it's especially true of art like this. She, she wants to blast off. She wants to blast into the aesthetic realm, and the aesthetic realm knows no nationality. At least we think not. I know that's a culturally specific thing to say. <clears throat> yes. Thanks. I found it very interesting, the difference between the, um, the, the what drawing. it's called, the, um, Preparation drawing, yeah. yes, and this, and uh, so I found the, and I talked to her about it, but I found this just very mischievous and very um, mm. kind of rebellious and, wow. and very cheeky, mm. and, uh, and then comparing that, which is very solid, 
But at the same time, I found uh, there was a rebelliousness to it, yes. but there was a structure. Huh. And when I asked her about it, I said, how do you do the, the preparation drawing? I mean, it feels like spontaneous, and so she said, it is spontaneous. Yeah, she's, they are she's spontaneous, just, right. She's just yeah. going for it. Yeah, and they, then, show, they, and they then, show the artist's hand, she doesn't clean it up, and this is one of a series. There's, there's going to be another one on either side of this before we get to this. Hmm. Yeah, but are you, do you think something is lost from that spontaneous to this, or what? No, I think, I think they're both wonderful and oh, okay. very different. Sure, I get that. And, um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but I was just interested in, in, her, um, in her method, and you talking about, and, and having seen the, the 1967 abstract in the back, um, it just feels to me that there's still that going on. Yeah, that was that, there's oh. a lot of that hmm. Hmm. feeling of that going on it's in good. there. Yeah. And then she comes and, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and structurizes it. But, um, and they're both just really inspiring, I think. I, the title of my essay for the catalog was Audacious Refinement. You know, I regard her art as very audacious, kind of daring. It dares you, this work. And I, I, in that sense, I agree with what you're saying, definitely. Yes, in the back. Yep. Let's um, get a microphone to you. I have one already. Okay, great. I've been waiting. <laughs> uh, so you, you were saying that most of her work, especially I think the earlier one, um, doesn't resemble any Latin American art, and that's what you know, other questions were pointing towards. To me, like all of this on the right, feels very much like Latin American patterns. So I don't know if like more recently she just, you know, she felt like going back to something I see. You know, closer to her roots or something. I have two words for you. Complete coincidence. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't see that in those works, I have to say. I'm not sure why. I don't know. But people see different things. People. Because, like, I, just to say, like, modern fashion and, you know, inspired by, like, Inca or pre-Columbian patterns, for me, really look like the one on the left here and the one right here. You're, that's, a, that's an interesting case you're making. Yeah. The, you might have, there might be something to that. Mm -hmm. It's not something that occurred to me, obviously, but you might want to run with that. <laughs> What else? 